Yeah, I think we can start. Yes, Tandan, sir? Yes. yes, yes, sure. So good afternoon, morning, evening to all the participants from wherever, whichever part of the world you belong to. A warm welcome from the Indian Association of Structural Engineering. Myself, Visalakshi, Honorary Secretary of IS Trakki, would like to welcome you all for this half a day online course on ethics and professional practice in structural engineering. Today we have gathered to learn the basic tenant, which is very much required for a human being to be human and which is very much required in not only in the professional life, but also in all facets of life for the personal, professional, in all facets of our life to be a human. Ethics are even more important for a structural engineering professional because we directly deal with the societal needs as we use our knowledge and skills for the performance of our professional duties, which are directly related to the public safety, public health, and welfare. So we feel that it is very much important for the structural profession. And if you look into the basic definition of ethics, uh, ethics are nothing but which mean uh, the character, the ideals, uh, the ideology, the standards or the principles which govern uh, personal behavior and also which, which help the person to react to the situation. So ethics are nothing but a mass of moral principles or uh, you can say a set of values. They, gi they give us or they guide us uh, in determining what is right, what is wrong, in distinguish distinguishing between what is true, what is false, what is just, what is unjust, and also to differentiate between proper and improper. Okay, These ethics will 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 allow us to be uh, honest, obedient, equal, fairness, in whichever we deal with in our day-to-day -day life. So therefore, ethics is a fundamental personal trait which one should adopt or one adopts in order to follow certain guidelines or principles. Therefore, these are the fundamental requirements of any person to succeed in his life or group of people in a profession for the profession to uh, grow, to succeed in its objective. So it is very important to know about the ethics. And, and uh, knowing this importance, I think uh, some of the universities have also started human values and ethics as a course in the engineering curriculum. But I feel that ethics is not a, not a subject which should be learned, written exam and forget about it. Ethics are the things which should be a part and parcel of our life. It should be a process through which our life should be leading. So, so therefore, with no further ado, uh, in order to talk about the ethics and also professional practices in structural engineering, especially, we have uh, among us, very well-known and uh, eminent personalities, Professor Mahesh Tandil, Mr. Alok Bahumek, and Mr. Manoj Mittal. So I'll first introduce the first speaker, Ms., uh, Professor Mahesh Tandil. A structural engineer, uh, I think there's no structural engineering, uh, structural engineer who doesn't know Professor Tandil. He's, he's one of the stalwarts in the structural engineering profession. And uh, there is no need, any, need of any introduction for him, but as a part of my job, 
let me give a brief uh, intro of uh, Professor Tangan. He's a past president of IS Truckee and also Society of Wind Engineers. He is the managing director of Tandon Consultancy Private Limited. And he's also a visiting professor uh, of IIT Gandhinagar. And uh, he's also a distinguished visiting professor appointed, appointed by AICT, INAE, for IITs such as Rurki, Kanpur, Gandhinagar, He's an international expert in the structural engineering field. And as we know that uh, the structures which have been designed by Professor Tandon are very well acclaimed, acknowledged, and uh, recognized not only in India, but also around the world. He's a member of National Committee of uh, Civil, Engineer, Civil Engineering, Institute of Engineers, uh, and also He's accredited with professional, international professional engineer, India. So without any further ado, uh, I request Professor Tandon to give the first uh, lecture of this webinar. Tandon, sir? Yeah, the, pla yes. the platform is all yours now. Thank you, Professor Visalakshi. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, at least that's what it is in India. And uh, we've had, we've heard a very good introduction of what is in store uh, today for the people who, are, who have joined in by uh, Professor Visa Lakshi. And uh, I will, of course, talk about, uh, let me just get this thing going. <laughs> it's easier said than done, see. Where is that gone? Yeah, it's here. Can you see this? Not yet, sir. You have to share. Yeah, I did that, but let me see again. Once more. Oh. One more time. <clears throat> Are you able to see it now? Yes. yes. It had started. Oh, luck at last. Okay. So, uh, you as you know, slide, mode, sir. slide show, sir. Put it in slide show. Now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all the help. Um, so uh, my uh, the, the, the um, the topic of my presentation is role of structural engineers in society. And uh, this is also being called the role sometimes is really shaping the built environment. So that is what I'm going to talk about. Some of the things that I will take up today, of course, these are by no means complete. And I'm sure that you will hear many more things from the two lectures which are to follow. I will be talking about some of the basic needs of man, mobility, quality of life, shelter, saving lives, and of course, some magic, which I want to also show you what structural engineers are capable of. So basic needs of man, if you come to, is social contact, a growing body of research shows that the need to connect socially with others is a base is as basic a need as food water water and shelter this is written in a recent book by uh, usl uh, ucla which is the university of california los angeles professor lieberman 
And uh, people who have not seen or heard about this book, I strongly recommend that you you read it because it has got so much about social contact. He says that why our brains are wired to connect. To socially connect, you may have to travel and transport for which infrastructure like bridges are necessary. So I will start with that. What you see here is amongst the oldest known bridge techniques to man. And you can see here, the bridge has been made across the river. How is this uh, bridge made? The roots of a, uh, of, um, of a fig tree are first taken across from one bank to the other. There they are allowed to grow over time. And sometimes it may take seven to eight years before they are strong enough for you to keep convert them into a bridge. There are no records to suggest when the Khasi community started the living root bridge tradition, but ecologists say it highlights the symbiotic relationship between people and nature. And Meghalaya, where this Khasi community now dwells, uh, or rather the, the area where Khasi community dwells is now called Meghalaya. Uh, Meghalaya is trying incidentally to get the UNESCO World Heritage Site tag because otherwise such a tradition of bridge building would just go into oblivion. But once it got it has got the UNESCO World Heritage Site tag, then people will visit it and we'll have a lot more tourists uh, apart from the people who are just interested in nature and how we can relate to it. On the right hand side, you can see the picture of uh, the finished uh, bridge and people are walking across and these are some youngsters who have gone there for a picnic. Here you can see a double decker. And I can tell you the structural engineer in this, uh, whoever is uh, uh, thought of this and made it happen, did not have an MTech degree. Even though now we keep insisting that unless you have an MTech degree, you don't, you are not an engineer. I think you can be an engineer, a structural engineer, or a bridge engineer, uh, even if you don't have the MTech degree, but you have the imagination. And certainly, the people who started this many thousands of years ago, uh, they had the technique and the um, they had the ability to think as to how to cross the river without wetting your feet. And this is how they made it. So double decker, this is the Nagpur Metro, which is of course here under construction now completed. It is not only uh, uh, these type of structures are made by people with MTech degrees, of course. And you can see the metro moving on the upper deck and the lower deck is for the, uh, for the highway traffic. So uh, yes, but we were not the first people to think of double decker. It was thought of thousands of years ago by the Kasi community. Every major city across the world is identified by a defining landmark, a bridge. I will show you only some of them, but in our own country, Kolkata, Mumbai, Delhi are certainly there. And of course you have London, San Francisco, Kobe. These are cities which are known by the uh, bridges or by at least one bridge. This is the Kobe bridge, or rather the bridge in Kobe. It's a suspension bridge and of course it still holds the world record of just short of two kilometers being the main span. If you come to 
uh, the signature bridge of Delhi uh, that you can see in the picture uh, on the top. And on the lower picture, you can see the sea link in Mumbai. So these are all 250 meters span. But really speaking, uh, if you see uh, the, the span, when it the way it is constructed is by free cantilevering and if you cantilever out from the uh, from the pylon outward really you're talking about double the span that you at one stage reach because just short of the uh, support here this is behaves like a cantilever and uh, that would be 250 meters so it's really equivalent to a 500 meter span And these are what they call uh, single pylon bridges. Normally, cable state bridges are made in, by having two uh, pylons and bridges are normally symmetrical. But here, although the lower one is symmetrical, but it's only one pylon, uh, a single pylon, which really supports the whole bridge. So there is a difference. So structural engineers are in the business of improving quality of life. Let us see some examples. This is a uh, flyover in Mumbai. And uh, as you can see, the, the ground level has been converted into a, a public space. And of course, it is uh, cordoned off and they have a guard all the time. So whether it's day or night, you can see people from this area, which is Matunga, uh, taking a walk, uh, socializing, making contact with each other. Uh, so it's open both day and night. And this is how the space below has been used. You may have seen trusses which are normally uh, associated with bridges. But here you can see a building whose sides are, are also, they also have a uh, truss. So this is another use of the truss which people have used quite uh, advantageously. And the person who first thought of it was Mr. Fazlur Khan, who was an engineer from Bangladesh and he traveled to the US and where he got a lot of opportunities to do these high rise buildings. And today, even uh, he died, uh, what, maybe 20 years ago, still the tall buildings are almost synonymous with. Fazlur Khan, because he made so many concepts where you can make these tall buildings. This is one of them. And uh, economy and speed made the skyscraper most attractive for builders. And that is how it came about. I mean, it had, for example, if you see right at the top, the Empire State Building made in 1931, which held the world record for many, many years. And of course, this Manhattan building, which you are seeing on your left hand side, the amount of, uh, uh, or rather not Manhattan building is of the same, even up to 1961, 275 kilograms per square meter was the amount of steel that it consumed. Per square meter means per, per square meter of the area of the floor of the building. So if you add up all the floor areas and multiply it by 275 kilograms, you will get the total steel used. But in the John Hancock Center, which you see on your left-hand side, the steel used is only 145 kilogram per square meter, far more efficient. And this was really an invention. And uh, Mr. Fazlur Khan is often called the Einstein of tall buildings. Here you can see whether it is in steel or it is in concrete, 
it is uh, a different type of a concept but in both of them what you see here is that the structure is no longer inside the structure uh, uh, which supports all the floors has been pushed to the outer periphery of the uh, building and you get an unobstructed column free space in the interior of the building and this is something which uh, i think improves the quality of life and you can see here what has been done in the center you have the core and the core is used for utilities and lifts but there is no other column inside the living space the the structure is on the periphery as you can see on the outside sometimes you can make a truss out of it sometimes you can make closely spaced columns and uh, uh, of course at every floor height you have the connection with beams so that is how the uh, thing has been made so quality of life is something that structural engineers strive to improve by the very concepts that they come up with structural engineers are in the, in the business of saving lives we can't stop the earthquakes from happening nor we can predict when they are going to happen but some idea I, this slide gives you that if you have a hard bedrock the, uh, uh, the 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 frequency of vibration of the earthquake in the earthquakes incidentally it is the earth that moves and whatever is above it by uh, the by its mass inertia it starts vibrating so uh, if you have something which is very short uh, in height its period is less than 1 second as you grow higher it, its period may be 1 second and of course if you go much higher its period may be 2 second that is the natural frequency of the buildings what we have talked about and if you have a hard bedrock the dominant period of the shaking is 0.5 seconds or when you have soft sediment it can be 2 and 1/2 seconds and anything in between the type of soil will have somewhere between 0.5 and 2.5 seconds generally speaking so now when you have a problem the problem is that when the frequency of the earthquake is close or it gets uh, uh, close to the one which is of the buildings above then those buildings are affected so depending on what the uh, period of vibration is i mean or what type of soil you have or substrata to be exact the type of buildings which will be most affected you can see from here and uh, the frequency of vibration of the building the natural frequency the first period which is the most devastating one is roughly equal to 0.1 into the number of stories of the building so let us say you have a 50 story uh, building uh, a very tall structure its period of vibration will be 0.1 into whatever it is so in this case 0.1 into 50 that is about 5 seconds that will be the period of vibration of a very tall building now the question is that engineers thought okay this is one way to handle this problem but is there is it possible that we completely decouple the movement or the frequency of the of the substrata from that of the building do you think it is possible well some engineers thought it was possible and that is how we had uh, the base isolation which i will oh sorry so i will just show you what how exactly it was uh, done the base isolation what it means it merely means that you see the left hand side 
this is where you have the normal building and on the right hand side you see one which is base isolated so if you are sitting in the building on the right hand side you will be sitting calmly during an earthquake you will not even know that the earthquake has come and gone professor tande we are not able to see the video you are not able to see the video yes yes uh, are you able to see now no it's the slides which we are seeing now oh i'm sorry if it is not coming but it was supposed to come so okay but let us not keep waiting for this invention of the you can put the slides in the slideshow again sorry you can put the slides in the slideshow again professor yeah yeah sure Oh. How is this gone? One second. Are you able to see uh, at least something? No, sir. No. You are not able to see anything. No, we are able to see, but not the video. Not the video. I I am skipping the video. Yeah. Okay. Are you, you able to put it in? Yeah, we are. Uh, we are able to see. Kindly okay. put it in the slide mode. Yeah, it is in the. Yeah. Fine, okay. fine. Okay, let me give you another example of you know, these tall buildings are being made. Uh, they have almost become a commodity now in the urban environment, and this one particularly is one of my favorites. It's called Taipei One O One. it's in taiwan and uh, taipei as you know is the capital of taiwan and uh, it's about 500 meters tall and it has about 100 stories and that's how it got it's got its name now the question is that when you have an earthquake in this type of a situation it's or you have typhoon like uh, wind which is quite normal in uh, these some of these countries like taiwan then the question is how to build, make the building safe can you imagine what would happen if this building were to fall with all these buildings around which look like pygmies in in comparison it would be a complete disaster apart from the people who are living inside this building so what is the technique used here i mean incidentally the uh, the design wind speed is 216 kilometers per hour and the earthquake is a 2500 year return period so you see this yellow ball i hope and this yellow ball is weighs about 700 tons and it is put more or less at the top of the building and as the building sways to left and right this ball of this huge uh, weight it moves in the opposite direction to which the the building is moving so if the building is trying to move to the right this ball is tuned so that it moves or swings towards the left hand side and therefore it uh, reduces the effect of the earthquake so this could have only been thought of some genius and this is called the tuned mass damper can you see this moving yes yes yes, yes. yes. okay the blue what you see is the representative of the building itself and in the middle this yellow is still the same yellow that is the 700 ton load and uh it is tuned in such a manner that 
whatever is the direction of the movement of the building it moves absolutely in the opposite direction and this is how the uh, the 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 structure is stabilized during an earthquake or during a, a, a gust of wind so let's go to yet another uh thing that structural engineers can do they they are magicians in a way at least some of them are and they can make the wildest ideas work let us see some of these wild ideas and how they were put in practice i will of course give you you know the magician doesn't give you all the tricks but just to keep your uh, appetite uh they give you some idea about one trick or the other so that you can understand as to how magicians work okay this is the turning torso in uh, sweden by the famous architect engineer kala trava and you can see the shape of this uh, building and uh, it is like you know a person is trying to bend across and the shape that his spine takes this right hand side at the top is what you can see what uh, that building looks like the whole torso is moving the now just to tell you the trick what it is although it looks as if it will be possibly impossible to do it but how do they do it so one trick i am sharing with you actually the if you look at the floor slabs they are not exactly one above the other they are they are uh, turned through a, a, a few degrees as you move from the top to the bottom slowly they keep moving and you can see at the bottom the first six floors for example are pointing in this direction and 90 degrees to that is the top floor so it's a the floors have been made like that so you are going to ask then how does it work how it works is that the spine just like in a human body it remains intact and straight it does not move here and there as the impression may be created so it's a uh, how it looks like is you can see here and also on one side one short side what trick they have been play, played is that you also have a truss of course this occupies a very little part of the building and of course a a a a, a view of the building which you seldom see at all but actually there is something here so it is much like you know the if you hold a pack of cards and this is your thumb let us say and you want to hold all the all the cards together you can but provided your thumb remains at the same place and the cards are displayed so it's a it looks like magic but actually it is just common sense but uh, it is the structural engineers who thought of this another view of a building under construction where the structural engineer secret has has become known if you see this the vertical supports are going from top to bottom in a straight line they don't change but it is the floor slabs one after the other they are actually changing so uh, they are not all parallel they are all changing the floor slabs and what we do is that on the edges of the floor slab you put any kind of a thing you can put a glass you can put any normally glass and you you will actually uh, begin thinking that the whole building is rota is rotated actually it is rotated but really speaking it is the 
vertical columns which are going from top to bottom and they don't change direction they just give you the impression that the 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 the, the, the building is actually rotating or has rotated and you wonder how it is standing so this is how it stands unfortunately the picture was somebody took the picture while it was being constructed so the it's like taking a photograph when the magic is being shown and the magicians often say please don't take any photographs but you can't say that to in a public space where a building is being constructed here is another peculiar kind of a shape of course it's a eco friendly luxury tower again it's a residential tower again in taipei and you see how beautifully uh, the finished product looks yeah sorry somebody opened the door and didn't close it so as you can see here this peculiar kind of a shape is also possible if you use your brains as to how exactly you can make it stable and this actually it is the middle part uh, of the building which does not change it remains the same and that is how the the building is made stable here's another fascinating structure it's a uh, there is a famous architect uh, fisher and he calls it the dynamic architecture and the rotating tower in dubai because dubai is the first place which could afford his imagination and you can you can think of how it was made possible only by structural engineers now what happens in this is that each floor can rotate independently of the others as you can see here it is shape of the building will looks like this if in the middle part all the floors are gradually turned it will look like this and so on and you can also look you know quite complicated but in this remember the secret the secret is that there must be one element like the spine of a human body that remains straight and the rest of it can rotate and each uh, each floor can actually see one view of the surroundings on one day and the next day it decides that now i have had enough so i want to turn look at the other side of the uh, uh, of the urban scape so he will press a button and the whole whole uh, building will uh, whole, uh, the whole floor will rotate as you can see here each floor is is capable of being rotated by itself it's much like a ruby cube i don't know whether they are still in fashion or not but that was another fascinating invention uh, so it is much like that that the, you can have each floor rotating but of course you require a structural engineer to make these type of things possible and is secret you must have the vertical element at least one like the spine of your beam which remains there only the outside can be anything the magician is like that only he is actually doing something else but you see something else let's go forward you see this building i mean this is uh, i mean it is amazing how just by steel tubes and uh, in one direction and perpendicular direction how you can make this stable let's look at this you will think that this structural engineer did not understand anything about slenderness ratios you cannot have a building which is that tall and uh, has only this much width do you think it is possible have you designed any building like that so here the structural engineer has played a trick so don't believe everything that you see what you are seeing is something else but actually what it actually is is shown here let me just enlarge this so that you can see what it is 
if you see it from the top, this is what the building actually looks like. But from one view, oh gosh, it is over here. I think you can see this uh, view where you see the triangle at the top. Alok? Hello? Yes, yes, can you can hear? see. Okay, you okay. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> so, <clears throat> structural engineers are well aware of fundamental concepts like <clears throat> slenderness, etc. But they can also play tricks because they know other things also. Here, you look at look at another building, and. Uh, if you see the number of amount of space that is occupied, is very little at the ground floor, at the, at the ground spaces. But you have a huge cantilever, uh, which is shaped in the like a like a handgun. I'm sure this somebody must have thought of it in America. That's where most of the guns are. So uh, the idea is that what whatever you do. In an urban environment, you must occupy the minimum space. So the structural engineers are uh, intimately involved in increased urbanization possible, to make it possible. Because by conserving the space on the ground, <coughs> this urbanization can be more smooth and it is going to be made possible and the rate at which urbanization is taking place all over the world is phenomenal so um, the percentages keep varying but in india also the i think in 2060 or something like that the urban population will be doubled so uh, you have to make space for them and if you keep on increasing keep keep on utilizing more and more space on the ground, less and less will be left for the people who have to still come. So conserve space at ground level is the other main job of the structural engineer. Here you see the uh, how many levels it is going down underground. So going underground, you can use that space. The space utilized at the Ground level is minimal, but several floors can be made down, as is shown in this uh, uh, photograph. And this is in uh, Hoskas uh, building, the metro building in Hoskas. Now, <clears throat> tall buildings, this is going skyward. You saw something going down underground. Now we are going up. If you want to go up, the present record is, of course, Burj Dubai, 828 meters tall. And under construction is a kilometer high building. It was supposed to be completed in 2019, but I think they found some uh, financial difficulties. So it's uh, not yet completed. That will be one kilometer <coughs> high. The first uh, person who thought of a tall building like this, it was called the mile high building. <clears throat> so one, one, one mile is the height of the building. And uh, as you can see that this was only an imagination of somebody. Uh, well, it is the imagination of Frank Lloyd Wright one of the greatest architects of the US has ever produced. And he also thought of the uh, this mile high building. But surprisingly, the shape that he conceived in a book actually is called the Testament. Uh, the new buildings which have come up, 
they are strikingly sim similar in shape. But when you go from one kilometer, let us say, to two kilometers, will the shape, shape remain the same? No, the shape will not remain the same. This is called the Ultima Tower, which is uh, a two mile high building and it has got 500 floors. And uh, you can see the other, for example, this is uh, Burj Dubai in comparison to what this one looks like. The shape is has to keep on growing because the bending moments, as you would know, uh, are the square uh, of the length. I mean, a simplified way of thinking is that if you double the uh, height of the building, the bending moment due to wind will be uh, four times in a very simplified method to see. Although everything is varying, the shape is varying. The shape has been made in this way so that you have less and less area, uh, surface area of the building exposed to wind. And as you keep on going down, you are trying to make the building uh, uh, broad, uh, broader and broader because that's where the bending moments keep on increasing. Also, the deflection incidentally, maybe three to the power three or to the power four instead of uh, if you remember your formula, WL4 by 384. So it's really the length is multiplied, uh, is uh, raised to the power four if you want to find out the deflection. So when you are talking about tall buildings, you have to worry about not only the strength, but also the comfort of the people who are living in it, and especially the people who are living right at the top. So there, what happens is the 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 deflection is important the acceleration is important because what you feel is not only deflection but people can get sick if you have uh, a movement which is uncalled for like for example uh, when you have these buildings installed in tall buildings like uh, even the one in uh, dubai uh, B B burj building the lifts cannot go more than a certain speed and acceleration. If they do, the people who are trying to uh, take the lift, they will get sick on the way. So uh, both are important, deflection and uh, 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 acceleration. So both have to be controlled. OK, so I think that I will end here. Uh, Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. I think we can take the question answers uh, questions at the end of the session. I would like to request our next speaker, uh, Mr. Alok Bhomik. And uh, I'll give a sh short introduction about him. Uh, Mr. Alok Bahumik is the immediate past president of IS Truckee. He is the chairman of the technical events and uh, he is very much instrumental for all these webinars we are, we are organizing. Uh, he is a fellow of National Academy of Engineers and he is also accredited with International Professional Engineer India. He has a vast experience in consultancy and its expertise lies, lies mostly in the bridges, flyovers, and infrastructure projects. He made significant contributions to the courts and, and a very active uh, member of uh, IRC, uh, IABSC, IASC, and IE. He made contributions to the upgradation of the courts, standards for various professional institutions. Uh, with this introduction, uh, I would invite uh, Mr. Alok Baumik to give his lecture. Baumik, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? 
Yes, Hello? but uh, but a very your your voice is very low. Okay, so I will uh, uh, I will switch off my video because that may be a problem. There is a uh, reduced signal. Just a minute. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Better now. So, okay, so I will try to uh, speak a bit louder. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Visalakshi. Uh, thank you, Professor Tandon. Uh, Professor Tandon spoke about the role of structural engineers in the society. Uh, it was a magical presentation. He showed magic. He showed us how incredible our profession of structural engineering is. Uh, in fact, the beauty of our profession is that we make life better for all humanity on a daily basis. And uh, I think society needs to recognize this. And we need to make some effort to also make society realize. Now, let me, uh, my presentation is on uh, leadership, ethics, and integrity, which are uh, key ingredients in engineering practice if you want to be magical, as Professor Tendon mentioned. I mean, we can do magic, but then for that, we need to have leadership skill. We need to follow certain ethics and integrity. But before I uh, start my presentation as chairman of the Professional Development and Technical Events Committee, let me start uh, by thanking my fellow panelists and the moderator, Dr. Visalakshi. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have all of you on board on this extremely important event, discussing a very, very important topic. And also, uh, I thank uh, our secretariat who are working uh, round the clock behind the scene. Uh, just let me uh, just share how we came to this topic. Uh, I will spend uh, half a minute for that. Actually, I was having a discussion with our president, uh, Manoj, who is also one of the speaker, uh, that, you know, we are not doing really enough uh, in improving the ethical culture in our profession. We are, uh, we felt that, you know, we are not focusing much on sensitizing our members on, on this aspect. Though we have been regularly uh, uh, having webinars, seminars, workshops on the technical structural engineering events. So we thought that why not we have a, 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 a half day lecture course on this very, very important topic, which is, which is extremely important. So let me begin, uh, you know, I have two parts. One is the leadership and the second is the ethics and integrity. So let me uh, begin my presentation with the first trait, uh, uh, which is leadership. Uh, you know, uh, I think as a structural engineer, if you are in the professional structural engineering, even at a young age, you need to start developing your leadership skill. You know, some people uh, have, uh, you know, uh, inborn leadership uh, uh, skills. But uh, I think leadership skill uh, needs to be also uh, inculcated, developed as you grow in the profession. And it's very important that you start working towards that right in the beginning of your uh, uh, career. Because you have to realize that as you grow, as you become senior, as you take uh, the uh, position of project manager or a senior structural engineer, you have to be a leader, you have to have leadership skill so that when you are talking to architects, when you are talking to clients, you can persuade them, you can convince them about uh, what is required as a structural engineer. Uh, many a times I find that structural engineers do lack in taking the leadership. They find their comfort zone in calculating many moments, shear force and doing, giving the designs and drawings. And uh, they don't, they play a subservient role or a secondary role in the profession when it comes to, uh, particularly for buildings, I would say. So leadership skill can position engineers for career advancement, you know, allowing them to assume a dominant position uh, as you grow in, this, in, the, in, the, in the profession. Uh, now, let me understand, let us, let us understand what, what I mean by leadership. Uh, leadership is essentially your ability to deal with people around you, 
uh, that doesn't mean that you have to be a team leader to take that position. Even if you are a, a junior uh, engineer, you have to communicate, you have to have a vision and you have to sort of learn the tricks. You have to have the problem solving skills. And if you, uh, if you do not possess those, you need to realize it early in your career and sort of, you know, uh, sort of take some kind of a soft skill training to develop those. Uh, a clear and simple leadership task for engineers, uh, according to me is shown here. That means you have got to first build the vision. Second, you have to communicate, communicate and communicate I think uh, you cannot, you can never communicate more. Uh, and the third is to clear the obstacles that comes in the way uh, of your team members. As you grow, there are many, uh, you know, impediments which you will find, you know, your juniors coming with problems. Your major job would be to clear the obstacles so that you can move forward. So these leadership skills, as I mentioned, are to be uh, built over the years. Uh, first, let me go into a little more detail on building the vision. How to build the vision? Uh, this is the very essence of leadership. If a person doesn't know where he wants to go, there is no uh, you know, uh, favorable wind to show him the direction. Uh, many a times I, I have seen in my career of 40 years that uh, there are engineers who are slogging, slogging and doing very hard work, but moving in the wrong direction. And when they realize that they have already spent some 15 days on that project in that particular direction. So what is very important is that you have to have a clear vision as to what is your target. And if you define your target and move towards that, you will be doing it very smartly. You will be spending minimum time and uh, you, know, you will be going, going in the right direction. Uh, you know, uh, generally, this uh, term vision is quite often uh, used in a kind of uh, uh, grandiose, as if the vision has to be of the of the managing director of the, of the company. Uh, it's not like that. You know, even uh, even a, a young engineer who has joined, he has been given a task. He should have a clear vision as to how he's going to complete the task within a limited time and in what direction. Uh, so that vision is uh, is important, whether you are a young engineer or a middle level engineer or a senior level engineer. You, as a leader, you need to make sure that you are clear on what is to be accomplished and what success would be there, uh, what you are targeting. The second uh, trait of leadership is communication, as I said. Uh, uh, effective communication is extremely important. It is critical to ensure that all the project participants are on the same page. If you are a team leader or if you are a middle level, if, if some subordinates are working under you, you got to have a proper clear communication with them. And as I said, I mean, you can never communicate more. When it comes to, uh, you know, developing uh, good communication skills, uh, many a times I find that uh, uh, we uh, we do not get the correct soft skill trainings uh, in our neither in our institutions academic institutions even when we come to uh, the the industry i think this is one area where uh, lack of uh, communication skill actually kills our initiative many of the uh, senior level engineers i have found uh, due to lack of communication they don't speak out in a meeting they keep quiet because they fear that you know they may not uh, uh, speak properly. They may not communicate well, and uh, therefore uh, they are at a disadvantage. So I think uh, attending soft skill trainings on communication uh, skill is is uh, important if you think that you are lacking in communication skills. And all these things you need to identify right in the early stage of your career, and then proceed. Third is uh, clearing the obstacle uh, of leadership. Uh, there are going to be challenges always, if, if, I mean, in, in any project, right from the word go till the completion of the project, there are many challenges. And uh, uh, I think uh, as, a, as a leader, when you take a leadership position, 
you need to sort of uh, always target should be clear and you need to interact communicate with client communicate with your uh, you know uh, boss or communicate with your subordinates but the primary goal should be clearing the uh, obstacle so these are the three uh, you know broad uh, leadership skills which i thought that i will i will share with you uh, uh, and if you follow this strictly i think uh, it will be good uh, individually next uh, i will come to the second part of my presentation that is on ethics and integrity uh, good work ethics is absolutely important a valuable attribute uh, both the society and the clients looks for in every consulting business it may not be stated anywhere uh, it may not be demanded but ultimately in the long run if you are performing if you are uh, you know if you have a good high ethical culture in your organization in the long run that pays people people would recognize you uh, if you have good ethics and high morality otherwise with time you uh, you will lose that you know after all consultancy is something which runs uh, purely on the basis of your integrity let me tell you so i think this you need to realize early in your professional career whether you are having your own setup or you are working somewhere but you need to maintain your personal and organizational ethical integrity ethical culture that is very important for you to grow in the profession so uh, this is a very vast topic ethics and integrity i can go on and on but considering the limited time i have restricted myself to only four challenges which i will discuss in this um, presentation on ethics and integrity uh, these are uh, given here in this slide that is bribery and corruption uh, procurement integrity conflict of interest and project ethics uh, for any uh, structural engineering consultancy organization to prosper uh, it is important that leadership in the organization deals with these four issues firmly and maintains a high ethical culture i mean of course this is easier said than done uh, what matters most is the tone at the top of the organization i mean uh, the, what is the ethical culture of the organization and uh, i can give you just one example of um, i think many of you may be aware of this enron uh, case uh, about 20 years ago this is a good example to demonstrate as to how unethical culture in organization can do to the company this was a accounting scandal uh, about 20 years ago uh, enron uh, misrepresented earnings and modified the balance sheet to indicate a favorable performance they actually cooked up the balance sheet and uh, from a 60 billion worth company in less than a month the company went bankrupt in i think 2001 uh, now let me come to the details of those four challenges which i mentioned i started with uh, bribery and corruption out of the four challenges uh, this is a graphic uh, which represents the perceived uh, level of corruption in some 180 uh, countries around the world and this is uh, based on survey conducted by a company called transparency international uh, they do this every year and this is a figure in 2021 and these are all uh, available in google you can download these charts they they are available for every year i think 2022 is yet to come as you can see in terms of uh, corruption india uh, you see the color code represents the most corrupt which is dark brown to light yellow which is the most uh, you know uh, sort of less corrupt least corrupt country and you can see that india is in a brown color somewhere in the middle not exactly in the middle uh, india is 85th in position out of 180 as far as the perceived level of corruption is concerned uh, in terms of score uh, india score is 40 uh, it was 36 in 2012 so in last about 9 years uh, it has improved in the corruption level from 36 to 40 that means it's a good thing uh, just for example, uh, the least corrupt country is Denmark, having a score of 88 as against 40 for India. 
and the most corrupt is Somalia. All these countries are, you know, Somalia, Syria, South Sudan, Yemen, North Korea, they are all most corrupt countries and uh, their score is 10 to 14, as you can see. Uh, so, you know, uh, it means that if you are working in India, you are facing various forms of corruption and uh, you may, uh, you, you may uh, vouch for, you know, you may be a highly ethical person, but if you are working in India or if you are working in Denmark, you, your, you know, freedom of uh, being uh, uh, ethical is different. The sliding, there is, the morality and the ethics has got a sliding scale. So there are certain things which are in your control, which you can do, but there are certain things which are actually not in your control also. So you need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, depending upon your own ethical culture, uh, you uh, individually, you decide as to what you should do. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that in India, uh, based on my experience, I can tell you that if you, if you want to have a business in consulting, without uh, bribery and corruption, you can exist. Let me give some examples of bribery and corruption uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, just two or three examples I will give. This is uh, the uh, photo of uh, Dhaka government factory, an eight-story building which collapsed in 2013. Uh, it uh, resulted in a killing of 100 and, uh, 1,100 people and injuring more than 2,500 people. The building owner, the building's owner ignored the warnings to avoid using the building after cracks had appeared uh, two days before. So there were white cracks, uh, you know, which appeared two days before the actual collapse, but uh, the owners and the designer ignored that. And finally it collapsed when it was completely, uh, you know, full uh, because being a government uh, business, you know, it was like a mall where all the floors were um, uh, full. Uh, what the investigation revealed is that the building was actually built over a pond. And the building was originally approved for five stories, but the top three stories were built without any uh, sort of design check, without any permission. The building was built on a very fast track with uh, time which was much less than the usual practice. That means they did not do the proper uh, uh, construction and workmanship was poor. And the contractor had used substandard material while constructing the building. This is a case where the factory owner colluded with the municipal authorities and this all occurred because of the unethical business practice which, which was there. Let me give the second example from our own country. This is, uh, I think many of us are aware of this uh, uh, bridge which collapsed during construction. This is Vivekananda flyover in Kolkata, which collapsed during, uh, in, in, in 2016, I think 31st of March. 26 people died and uh, more than 50 people were injured. Reason for this collapse are many, but the prime, if I, if I you know, uh, sort of, uh, give the key points. There were ghost contractor who were allowed to do the work. The lead contractor on paper was a Chinese partner, but he was absent from the work. A local Indian contractor was actually executing. Substandard material was used. The steel samples failed, but still used despite the fact that on paper it failed. Unapproved drawings were used for execution. The consultant engaged was incompetent, inexperienced, with high connection with the uh, owner client. Uh, state government, very interestingly, took five years after the collapse to decide on the fate of the balance portion of the flyover, which, is, which, is, which was standing as a testimony of the poor workmanship. You see, what failed has failed, but what was remaining was a good example of poor work. And that was a clearing example of bribery collusion between all the parties and gross violation of all ethical practices that we preach. Third example, and the last example of this I would give is that of uh, Emerald Tower in Noida, very close to Delhi. 
which was very much in the news uh, last August. The towers were built in violation of the building bylaws. Lloyd Authority gave sanction for the construction of this 40-story twin tower in collusion with the builder. Even the Supreme Court calls Lloyd Authority as highly corrupt. Uh, Supreme Court has now ordered demolition of these towers, as you all know. Uh, just imagine, I mean, the consequences of the demolition of uh, these 40 story two towers. The, just imagine the carbon footprint uh, that will be generated because of this demolition. So the society is paying a very huge price for corruption. And I think that is the key point which I wanted to uh, underscore that. So, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned that in some countries, uh, bribery is just another cost of doing business. Uh, as a consultant, uh, we often face a situation uh, uh, where it is a choice between paying by or preaching. And in such situation, you are often left with uh, little option or no option but to pay. So we often uh, face this ethical dilemma. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a choice. But if you want to bring a change in ethical culture, I think it is very important that as an individual, we need to bring our own value system and ethical spectrum into the organization where we are working. If we are heading the organization, then it is much easier because you can you, can, you have a lot of say. But if you are, uh, let's say, a, a young engineer, but you have very high individual morality and ethical standard, and you find that the organization you are working do not maintain the same ethical standard, then your challenges are, uh, are more. But if you are firm on your uh, you know, uh, ethics, and if you are uh, sort of a person with a uh, lot of uh, you know, uh, tenacity and commitment, then you can, I know the situations where you can even go and uh, you know, persuade uh, your organization uh, top to sort of change the ethical culture. I mean, I think uh, you, you can do a lot. And if you think that you are uh, in a situation where you are not able to uh, uh, sort of change in the organization, then you have to take the hard decision. I think this is my, my, my way of, uh, my advice. Now, uh, let me come to the uh, second part, which is procurement integrity. And uh, uh, procurement, procurement, you know, public procurement uh, is one of the government activities which is highly vulnerable to uh, uh, corruption. And what is procurement integrity is whenever you uh, sort of uh, procure something, whether a service or whether goods, you have to do it honestly, fairly, impartially, legally, and appropriately and transparently. This is what is the definition of procurement integrity. But uh, lack of procurement integrity is pretty widespread. Uh, consultancy engineering fraternity is no exception. It is common in consultancy business, for example, to offer job, uh, you know, post retirement to high level government officials in return for a favoring business. We see it in almost many, many organizations. I mean, I think we are witness to all these. Uh, Firms with high ethical standards deal with the issue of procurement and integrity pretty firmly. And I know some of the organizations who have an ethics and compliant manager in their team who, who are uh, with, with an independent body who are supposed to take care of uh, you know, ethics within the organization. And these kind of organizations also are there. So there is a very wide variation of you know, uh, ethical culture that I find in our, uh, in the spectrum. Now, let me give you one good example of how firmly the issue of ethics was dealt with in one uh, case. This is uh, in 2003, and uh, this is between Boeing and uh, defense, uh, uh, USA defense. This lady uh, by the name Darlene Druyun was the Air Force official. And uh, he, she was dealing with Boeing executive, the chief finance officer, Mike Sears, in one of the deal uh, for uh, you know, buying some uh, uh, Boeing uh, jets for the, India, uh, for the US defense. And uh, parallelly, she was negotiating her job 
post retirement with Boeing. And when this came to uh, limelight, the management fired its top uh, CFO. The lady was working, uh, and the lady also was fired. And then uh, she was jailed, she was uh, fined. I mean, uh, and also the CEO had to resign, forced to resign. This all actually happened, and it is all, uh, I mean, if you want to go into more details, you can just Google it. It's a very interesting case. Uh, as far as the public procurement is concerned, we in India, we have several uh, classic examples of corruptions in government level procurement, which is shown here. Uh, Beaufort scam, Fodor scam, SW submarines, coal scam, CWG scam, all these are basically part of the lack of procurement integrity in the, in the, in the society. And uh, this is what is something which we need to be aware. And though I would say in consulting business, uh, uh, it is not that far fetched, but I think even in consultancy business in the, uh, in the, in the reduced form, it is there and we need to talk, take, take care of that. The third part, which I wanted to discuss is about the conflict of interest. Uh, conflicts of interest is not always intentional, uh, but many a times there are un unintentional bias also, which is widespread, a problem, uh, you, you know, which we some many a times we don't even realize that it's a problem. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, these are considered as examples of conflicts of interest at work. And I can tell you, uh, for example, hiring an unqualified relative in a job. Starting a company that provides services similar to your full-time employer. Negotiating for job with a vendor or client while continuing to do business with them. Posting to social media about your company's weaknesses. Offering paid services on your time off to a competitor company. I mean, all these, I don't want to read through the full thing, but these are things which, you know, uh, uh, many a times we don't even uh, you know, think uh, for a second, but do it. So I think it is very important that we need to very consciously have our own ethical and moral standards where we have our own checklist of do's and don'ts. And if we can practice that, uh, though, as I mentioned, it is easier said than done. But many a times, you know, it helps. It helps. And it should be not only done when you are having a problem, because then you will, your decisions will be different. You need to practice it even when uh, in good times, you know, when you do not have a problem. Uh, the last part uh, is about the project ethics in consulting. Uh, you know, these, uh, this slide shows some fundamental canons for professional engineers working in any project. And uh, this fundamental code of ethics are there, I think, everywhere, whether uh, you see the, uh, the, the bylaws of the engineering associations like IS-FACT or uh, IS-FACT UK or any other professional associations. Generally, you will find uh, that these canons will be there, that is holding paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public, performing services only in the areas of their competence, issuing public statements only in objective and truthful manner, act for each employer or client as truthful agents or trustees, avoid deceptive acts, conduct themselves honorably, reasonably, ethically, and lawfully. So all these things exist when we sign, when we become a member of any professional associations, we are signing in dotted lines. And we are saying that we are going to follow all this, but uh, it is, you know, uh, it, is, it is generally not followed. And uh, I think it is time uh, if each individually, we need to be aware and conscious about it and try to follow this. Uh, I will give a, one more example of, you know, how this project ethics is compromised in this very interesting um, uh, sort of uh, case study. This is a, a, a there was a, a controlled in-flight engine failure uh, of a Boeing A380 flight in 2010, uh, some 469 people were on board and uh, uh, this, this engine got fired, fire, uh, you know, in fire during the flight to Singapore. Uh, if you imagine what would have happened if it got blasted, but fortunately the pilot 
maneuvered well and the flight got uh, landed at the uh, Changi airport. After that, the investigation revealed that there was a misaligned counter bore uh, in the engine, which actually caused this, uh, uh, you know, fire in the engine. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go, go into the structural detail, but uh, there was an oil line in the engine. And when the oil line was manufactured, there was a defect in the form of misaligned counter bore. What you see in the right hand side is the bore and you can see the thickness here and thickness on the other side is different. That means the inner and the outer, the thickness is not constant. And there were some thinner portion and that uh, actually bursted due to the oil pressure uh, caused by fatigue. And this was the real cause of failure. After investigation, the findings was that the, you know, they, they realized this engine was supplied by Rolls Royce. And uh, what they found is that in the, in the factory itself, uh, the, uh, it was identified, it was, it was identified that there is an error in this uh, uh, wall, thin wall section. It was non-conforming on paper, but despite that, it was let go. So, in fact, uh, what they say is that the economic pressure encouraged looking the other way. The engine supplier of Rolls Royce weak performance and margin forced them to do so. The wall thickness non-conformance was known to the Rolls Royce manufacturing floor, but not notified to higher ups. Experience had taught staff that their managers would do nothing even if notified. So therefore, they did not inform. Non-conformance subsequently discovered by the Rolls Royce engineers who did not raise alarms but instead approved the non-conformance retroactively through faulty statistical analysis. And contrary to policy, the retroactive approval was also not notified to the higher ups in the Rolls Royce, chief engineer or business quality director. So, uh, I mean, these are some uh, examples which uh, reveals that how lack of ethical culture uh, individually or as a group can lead to disaster. I mean, disaster in many forms. And uh, therefore, I, I, I close with the closing remark that the structural engineers are uh, in perfect position to be the leaders and innovators. They have the skill, they have the temperament and understanding of the built environment to lead the next disruptive changes to advance society. To take leadership position, the structural engineers need to have vision, good communication skills and problem solving skills in addition to the technical skills. In a modern professional climate, key to running a successful consulting business is to have a working ethical culture. Good work ethics is a valuable attribute that clients look for in every consulting business. Success of an organization is based on the trust of customers, employees, and the general public. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alok Bhamik, sir, for uh, touching upon the sensitive issues uh, such as ethics, integrity, morals, etc. Now we could uh, uh, correlate the ma this uh, presentation, which was given by Professor Mahesh Tandon, the magics which have been created by structural engineers. Those marvelous structures can only see the light if they had integrity in their designs, if they were ethical, and if they have followed the moral principles. Thank you. Thank you so much for touching upon the sensitive issues. Now, uh, I would like to invite our uh, uh, third speaker, Mr. Manoj Mittal. And uh, uh, Mr. Manoj Mittal is the present president of uh, Indian Association of Structural Engineers, and uh, under whose leadership we could able to organize all these webinars and disseminate the knowledge to the fellow structural engineers. Uh, he's an accomplished civil and structural engineer and he is doing his consultancy for over 35 years of his professional experience. Uh, he has expertise in structural diagnosis, investigation, sustainability, and project management. He's a very strong believer in uh, ethics, 
morals, good practices in professional uh, organizations, which needs to be followed, and also management. He feels that good construction practices and management both go hand in hand with the good designs. He, he always wants and strives uh, to incorporate sustainability and safety uh, aspects in, the, in all the projects. He's a member of various professional organizations and he's an active member contributing for the upgradation of the courts. Uh, uh, either it may be the BIS courts or IRC courts, etc. Uh, he is also he has also served uh, on the board of Power Grid, a Maharashtra CPSC uh, Government of India organization uh, thing as an independent director. Recently, he has started hosting a podcast named Samvad, uh, the objective of which is the society and the culture where he wants to uh, interact with the people and give awareness uh, to the people related to the uh, morals, ethics about the society, etc. So with these words, I would like to invite Mr. Manoj Mittal to deliver his talk. Mittal, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lakshmi, for a, a very nice uh, introduction. I don't think, I am not sure whether I deserve that kind of introduction. Uh, uh, so, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Mr. Lakshmi, can you see my screen? Yes, 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 you can. Okay. I think you can just put it in the uh, right. Like, okay. yeah. yeah. Right, right. Okay. So uh, I will be speaking on professionalism and ethical dimension in structural engineering. And before me, uh, Professor Tandan and Alok Bhamik and also Visalakshi in introduction has covered some of the points which I wanted to cover. So uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I will try to skip those points and to avoid the duplicacy. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, uh, I will be uh, covering uh, each and every term of the topic which is there on the screen. That is professionalism, uh, ethic, ethics, uh, and structural engineering. How they are related, and uh, why they are important to us as a as a structural engineer, as a structural consultant, or as a civil uh, uh, consultant. <clears throat> so. Uh, Okay, so usually we as a uh, civil or structural engineer, we uh, we always uh, talk about all these terms. We talk about technical specifications, design, drawings, standards, conditions of the contract, quality assurance, project management, this, this. We always talk about all those things. We always say that we should have a requisite qualification and all those things. <laughs> True, we should have all those things. But there is something which is uh, another very important uh, dimension to our profession that is uh, ethics or ethical uh, practices. So uh, unless until we are professional, unless until we, uh, we are ethical in our professional practice or professional conduct, I don't think we can say ourselves as a professional. In spite of the fact that we might be having the requisite qualification, we might be designing, we might be expert in designing and all those things. No, you are not a good professional engineer if you are not following good ethical practices and you are not a true professional. So let's try to understand uh, uh, what do you mean by, what do we mean by profession? What is professionalism? What is ethics? How it is related to the profession? Who is a consultant? And uh, professionalism and ethics in structural engineering. So uh, these are all uh, important points. We should learn. Uh, we should not use them uh, very vaguely or uh, loosely. We generally use these terms uh, in day-to-day -day conversation. But we should understand what are these terms and what are the meanings and, uh, and how to implement them, how to follow them, why it is important to us. So. Uh, and you will be very uh, happy to know that just now Visalaki said that I have started my podcast called Samvad and you will be happy to know that first episode was on ethics only and uh, the, in that uh, episode uh, I did a conversation with Alok Bhabik on ethics only. 
only so if you want to learn more i think if you go through that uh, episode you will be able to understand more on this that has further more uh, dimension to ethics so let's try to understand uh, these terms okay so first of all let's try to understand what is uh, profession and then uh, what is uh, what do we mean by professionalism so usually as we understand uh, 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 profession means uh, something which uh, which requires a specialized knowledge and which has a long and intensive academic preparation as we do we just structural uh, engineer we do a, a bachelor degree masters degree in engineering so we undergo a specialized knowledge uh, intensive academic preparation that yes that we do so we can say yes we 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 are uh, structural engineer structural engineering is a, a profession so uh, the whole body of a profession this is a general term uh, the the group of a person a body of a person who are engaged in a particular uh, type of thing uh, we say it is a profession for example sometimes we also try to say that uh, uh, the plumber carpenters worker uh, maintenance workers and all those skilled construction workers see they are all skilled but uh, but they are not called professionals they are not called professions uh, they, these are not professions they are trades they are craftsmen or trades they are not uh, profession although they are uh, doing the same kind of work and they are doing skill work but still uh, we don't call them profession so basically when we say professional uh, it it means uh, professional usually do the mental work uh, the knowledge based work uh, not uh, usually the physical work by the plumber carpenter they do the physical work we as a engineer we as a structural engineer uh, we do uh, the mental work usually all professional uh, even even doctors and uh, lawyers they all do the mental work so they, so they are called uh, professionals and that's called law is profession medicine is a profession engineering is a profession so uh, we know we need to have academic uh, qualification we need to have uh, we might be we should be need to be doing uh, mental uh, work uh, not not the physical work uh, and then what are the uh, basic characteristics of a professional uh, see when i will be making the presentation i uh, a, 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 a structural engineer or civil engineer who is uh, into a private practice will be my focus but it doesn't mean that uh, whatever i am telling is applicable to them only it is applicable to other civil structural engineers who are working in some organization or a particular a consulting organization so it will be more applicable to them so uh, so what are the basic fundamental characteristics of uh, a professional so we say that they share the great responsibility when a client gives you a job uh, to design or to construct or supervise or to certify basically what he is doing he is entrusting you with uh, a great responsibility and obligation so so uh, uh, because uh, he, he is giving you a lot of responsibilities he is trusting you so under these situations given these inherent obligations professional work typically involves a circumstances where carelessness each word is very important see care carelessness inadequate skill or breach of ethics uh, would be significantly damaging to the stakeholders for you so if we are not as we uh, if we are not a very qualified person if we do not have a, a requisite skill to perform a job which we have taken from a client or we are not following the ethical practice in our uh, professional uh, conduct it means it may, it may lead to significant loss to my client or to an organization who has interested me a job a work so uh, a professional uh, literally share a great uh, responsibility we cannot uh, we cannot uh, afford to fail uh, we cannot afford to uh, Uh, fail in our professional work another thing is accountability professionals holds themselves ultimately accountable for the quality of their work so if we are uh, designing if we are supervising if we are uh, into any 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 uh, scope of the uh, project and if that service has been rendered by us then we are responsible for that we cannot pass the uh, the, the buck on somebody else so if we cannot take the responsibility for the work which we are doing it means uh, we are not uh, professional uh, we can call ourselves as a professional only if we can we know how to take the account we are we should uh, feel accountable for our work 
so sometime uh, uh, what happens our profession may or may not have the mechanism in place to enforce and ensure the adherence to the principle among its members for example in engineering uh, in india we do not have any uh, regulation we our profession is not regulated by an act by a central act or by any state act so as such we are not uh, regulated by by that kind of a uh, regulation still still even if we are not regulated uh, like law and medicine uh, uh, still uh, an individual professional will ensure, will himself ensure that this accountability is ensured in my in my organization i will ensure that my my people in my organization they take the responsibility if i am the head of the organization then i i should ensure that i take the responsibility so it is not necessary that there is there has to be a regulation there should be a regulation if it is not there it is still we can uh, take this accountability this is very important to be a, a professional so uh, 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 professionalism also based on specialized uh, theoretical knowledge that i already said uh, professionals render services we as a structural engineer we render specialized services in into design in project management or uh, retrofitting or anything based on the theory and knowledge and a skill which we have acquired and particularly that are most often peculiar to their profession and generally beyond the understanding or capability of those outside the profession so basically we are working in a profession we are rendering those services which are basically confined to a particular profession so uh, uh, like structural engineering uh, designing now that thing cannot be done by somebody else that can only be done by a person who is a qualified for that job and who has a requisite experience of doing that thing so a, a medical doctor cannot do that a engineer cannot uh, do the surgery or cannot prescribe the medicine so this is uh, a trait of a professional now institutional preparation basically uh, uh, a profession typically requires a significant period of hands off or practical training under an experienced uh, uh, professional engineer uh, under a protected uh, company of a senior member uh, before uh, uh, before they are recognized as professional the uh, most of us now do uh, practical training or internship or uh, they work under some uh, experienced engineer only then they have become capable of rendering independent consultancy services or any kind of services to the client uh, although we do not have any uh, formal uh, system of internship or training and all those things but still most of us do it in a informal manner and uh, and basically uh, for a professional uh, this is a very very important requirement you just cannot start working in a profession you just cannot start handling the project independently simply coming out of a college having a degree so you need this kind of a training uh, under under a under the experience of an engineer only then you will have requisite uh, confidence also for doing the work autonomy uh, so uh, this is another trait uh, professionals have control over and correspondingly ultimate responsibility for their own work professionals tend to define the terms processes and conditions of the work to be performed uh, for the client so usually uh, uh, you we as a as a as a consultant we can always uh, say we can always uh, tell our client uh, what uh, our fees will be what will be the our scope of the work and what will be the process how we will do this kind of a thing because every project is a unique project and we are also unique and each individual can have a different kind of uh, way of doing the thing and they can have a different kind of experience competence and processes of doing the thing so before start, starting the work they can definitely uh, discuss with the client and they can uh, set the terms uh, references and the fees and and if, if they are agreeable to do only then you will do the work otherwise you will not do the work nobody is forcing you to 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 to, to do the work at a, at a lesser fee it is we 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 who do the work at a lesser fee it is up to us uh, what we want actually so we we as a professional have some kind of autonomy then we have client not the customer uh, we as a professional we never say he is my customer we always say he is my client now what is the difference between client and a customer if you have a shop 
if you have a business you have a shop there will be a person will be coming to your shop and you will whatever the thing you have in your shop you will give give to him at that particular rate you will not deny him you will not say no to that to to him uh, to any customer but uh, uh, but uh, uh, a, a member of a profession uh, like structural engineering profession or civil engineering profession they exercise discrimination in choosing clients now it is for me whether i want to work for this client or not i cannot uh, nobody can force me to take any particular job or or, or accept any uh, uh, project so i as a professional i can choose my client uh, uh, but but probably a, a merchant or a shopkeeper uh, cannot uh, do that uh, because uh, we have a client uh, they are not my customer so then then the ethical constraint as, as alok also said earlier that usually all professionals are bound by a code of conduct like uh, medical council of india has their own uh, code of conduct uh, uh, then then law ha lawyers have their bar council of india they have other uh, their separate uh, uh, ethic uh, code of uh, conduct of code of ethics uh, uh and the, the difference between engineering and other profession is that we do not have any 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 uh, act of the parliament so basically we are member of various professional bodies like institution of engineers or institution of structural engineers or, uh, or any other uh, professional body so ultimately uh, each uh, such professional body also have a code of conduct and when we become the member of those associations or professional body we are supposed to follow that code of conduct so ultimately we are also uh, we as the uh, structural engineers are also supposed to follow that code of conduct so professionals also aspire towards a general uh, uh, and and each profession has their own uh, separate code of conduct and their code of conduct may be different depending upon the uh, uh, the requirement of their profession medical professionals uh, code of conduct will be some different different than the engineers uh, that will different for the lawyers so that but but the basic thing may be the same but otherwise uh, uh, there will be uh, many differences uh, in in their code of uh, conducts so basically if you try to define what is the professionalism i would say that professionalism means behaving in an ethical manner uh, behaving in an ethical manner while assuming and fulfilling your rightful responsibilities in every situation every time without fail it means having the requisite ability to be worthy of the confidence others place in you others means client and other stakeholders place in you so this is a true definition of uh, professionalism it also means in every situation willfully gathering responsibilities rather than avoiding it it's quite simply if the buck doesn't stop with you you are not a professional we should learn to take the responsibility for the work which we are doing only then we can say uh, we are a true uh, professional so this is uh, this was about uh, the uh, professionalism and the profession now uh, as a civil or structural engineering as a profession yes uh, we all know that we are civil or structural engineer rather all engineers they are basically the problem solver they benefit the people they provide uh, public services uh, we are all applied physical scientists we are not scientists uh, but but we are applied scientists we apply the science uh, the, the principles of science uh to public utility to provide public service and we uh, are the we are the drivers for converting technology uh, to the benefits we are rational we are logical we are systematic and we are concerned with public safety and well being as uh, vishalakshi uh, said earlier uh, that uh, we, whatever we do we do uh, in public safety and for the well being of the people so basically these are the uh, Uh, uh these are the basic uh, 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 traits of a civil engineering uh, or structural engineering uh, profession and we also know that uh, engineering occurs at the confluence of technology uh, social science and the business so there is a technology uh, and technology will have impact on the social society uh, and the culture and society of a country or any any any, any group of people uh, and then uh, there should also be some kind of a business out of that so when these three interact each other uh, uh these this is important and engineering occurs at the confluence of all these three all the three things 
so engineering decisions are usually have impact on all the three areas uh, in the consequence and public nature of the engineers work ensures that ethics will always play a role because we are involved in a work whether we are designing or supervising or certifying or testing uh, 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 basically we are dealing with the public we are dealing with the public safety and public welfare public health so uh, so 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 uh, ethics is important uh, for us uh, uh, ethical practices very very important for us as alok said the bribery and all those things integrity uh, he say, he also gives many examples uh, how the failures and all those things have happened because of the uh, unethical uh, practices so uh, professional engineers uh, we we as a professional engineers must ensure that interest of the stakeholders interest of the stakeholders who are the stakeholder the client the contractor the the public uh, maybe the government uh, must prevail over their you know, and their organization's interest if i am a consultant uh, the interest of the public the stakeholders or my client uh, should be much above than me or my organization this thing we should understand as a professional engineer uh this is a basic uh, factor which we must keep in mind in every dealing we do on day to day basis now <laughs> this is another very important thing who is a consultant we say we are consultant we are structural consultant we are civil engineering consultant we are project management consultant uh, we are this consultant that consultant and we also say we provide services to the client and all those things but uh, but this is a very interesting definition who is a consultant now see the consultant uh, provides services okay we provide services uh, for which client do not have uh, knowledge or competence we will be doing something for which client uh, department or client organization or client himself do not have that kind of a knowledge understanding so he is hiring us to provide that kind of service this is the first thing second thing is we charge fee for the service rendered we will not do it free if we are doing free you are not a consultant so you will charge for the services which you are going to render to a client then another important thing is you rendered service you got the fee no job is not over another important dimension is that client must also feel obliged for the services rendered by the consultant this is another important thing since client do not have that kind of a knowledge or expertise you have provided some services although he has paid to you but still client must feel obliged okay so this is a very uh, uh, very very important uh, dimension that uh, uh, that if you are a true consultant then your client should always feel that oh, oh he, he is a person he is a consultant he he has done this thing uh, to our project and he saved me so much money and he he did uh, this kind of project to me so that kind of some 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 kind this kind of feeling should be there in the client our client organization they should value you as a consultant they should not uh, so there is a difference between consultant and service provider so uh, if that kind of a feeling is not there then you are not a consultant you will you are merely a service provider you are just uh, giving the service to the client and taking the fee that's all like telecom services telecoms what they are doing they are also providing services their services are quantifiable they say we will provide you so much of the db data they say they will provide this kind of uh, 5g 4g whatever they are saying and they say this is my rate and and you take a package and you do you use that and you pay to them okay and if you do not want to uh, subscribe to that then it's up to you and rates are standard and you are they are service providers their services their their package their services 5g 4g data speed bandwidth this and that can be quantified and you pay according to that but but we as a consultant we are doing knowledge based service we are rendering knowledge based service to the client so and what kind of a quality i will do what kind of drawings we will produce what kind of detailing we will do how much time we will put into that that is very subjective also okay so uh, so there is a difference between client uh, consultant and a service provider we are not service providers we are providing services but we are consultant although at present i have seen that many of the government departments and government public sector undertaking they treat consultant as a service provider only this is very uh, unhealthy situation they also ask for 
uh, earnest money they also all those kind of thing as as they treat as a uh, contractor kind of a thing no that is not true a true consultant is not uh, a service provider so we should uh, learn that that distinction so now uh, uh, that i was talking about the consultant who is a consultant what is what do we mean by profession so we can say yes we are uh, professional uh, structural engineering is a profession uh, we are uh, a consultant but uh, theoretically yes but we will be true consultant and we will be true professional if we follow all those things in our day to day practice uh, in our offices so now ethics uh, uh, as i think everybody understand and uh, also uh, uh, it was uh, to uh, conveyed in the uh, introduction also that ethics is a word which came from the uh, came from the ancient greek word ethico and ultimately uh, into english it came as a thing uh, so it, it is something uh, you know, something which is ready to the character it has something uh, which is related to the moral uh, nature so ethics has somehow uh, related is somehow related to the, your character and your uh, values so uh, uh, you cannot think of ethics without your character so uh, ethics moral values and law these are all uh, related uh, looks like a related related terms ethics moral values and law so ethics refers to the guideline for conduct that addresses questions about the morality they are systems of uh, uh, of moral uh, principles Uh, they tell us what is morally correct or incorrect in the given situation they are generally uniform uh, they uh, determines extent of rightness or wrongness of our options uh, they are they constrain our actions or decisions so basically you can uh, uh, think it like that moral values are the principles of right and wrong and uh, they stimulate our thinking uh they uh, strongly influence the emotional state of mind they act as a motivator they come from the family upbringing family environment ethos of the society uh, in religion also has some kind of influence on you the society the country and so uh, all those things uh, and the kind of education uh, you got and kind of a, uh, a friends you have ultimately uh, from the childhood only the kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, values you imbibe uh, in your uh, they 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 start becoming your character and they start becoming moral values and they shape you uh, you as a as a person and these moral values uh, are individualistic oriented uh, uh, and they will depend upon the circumstances the kind of upbringing a person have so uh, individual uh, persons may have a different different uh, moral values uh, uh, there might be some differences between uh, uh, they, but they are all individual uh, moral values so uh, basic things are the same but there might be some changes in the moral values uh, which uh, which individuals have and these moral values also keep uh, are usually same uh, over the period of time but they also do change over generations it take a lot of time to change and they may change because of the technological development or some other situations but usually they remain constant in your mind so as a person whether you are an engineer you did your engineering degree or masters degree or doctorate degree and you came to the profession so these values which you imbibe through your uh, through in in your growing period they always remain with you and they act as a stimulator they act as a a motivator and they influence your decision uh, making uh, process at every stage of decision making your moral values will come to picture so uh, 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 so ethics are uh, uh, ethics you can say uh, ethics are a set of moral values uh, as as uh, applicable to a particular uh, profession or as applicable uh, to a particular organization and ethics are basically ethical code of conduct and all those things are basically a collective uh, moral values kind of a system uh, which has evolved which is which has been evolved for a particular uh, organization particular profession uh, and particular uh, 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 set of uh, activities so yeah, but but the uh, the code of conduct and ethical principles are also based on uh well accepted uh, 
uh, moral values only. Moral values is the core of all, all ethics and ethical uh, practices and code of ethics. So what happens? Uh, uh, okay, so let's talk about the law also. Uh, uh, now there's a difference between moral values are my individual, ethics are uh, ethical practices or a code of ethics is basically profession based or uh, or, 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 or organization based, uh, depending upon, uh, but they, the core, at the core is a moral values only. And laws are basically, these are the binding code of conduct and they are written rules. Uh, they are basically legislative, legislated by the legitimate authority, maybe the parliament, maybe the assembly. And there is no chance you cannot avoid following them. You have to uh, follow them and they are formally recognized and enforced. And even company policies also come under the category of the law. So you cannot avoid the law. You uh, will be punished if you are not following the law. But these ethical practices are basically since these are not, uh, these are morally binding. These are not uh, legal bi binding as such. So you are morally uh, obligated to uh, follow the code of ethics, which are basically based on the moral values, but they may or may not be enforced uh, by the law. So, uh, uh, so basic ethical principles are always general and eternal, remain same for all uh, humans. Values have individualistic approach. It varies from person to person, but generally remains stable. While legal rules can be changed due to world interest, time and location, tools can change, law can change. Something can be uh, uh, legal today, maybe <laughs> illegal tomorrow also. And these decisions are taken by the majority. So, uh, uh, engineering, the ethics uh, is contextualized basically. So, if it is being, we say engineering ethics, if it is being applied, the moral principles which are being applied to the engineering practice of engineering, we say engineering practice. If, if it is my personal thing, it becomes a personal ethics. If it is uh, belonging to a, pers a professional, we say the professional ethics. So, it is a set of uh, moral values uh, which guide you how to conduct, how to take a decision, how to uh, give the priority to different things and how to deal with co-professionals. So these are all philosophical theories, uh, basically how uh, you take a decision. So it is called utilitarian theory. Basically you say the decision is a good decision in so far as it provides for the greatest good to the greatest number. There's another theory which say the decision is good if it is based on the professional where duties one has to follow. If I have some professional duties, if I am following that, I can say this is why I have done my duty, I am ethical. It may or may not be doing the greatest good. So uh, another theory is that a decision is good if it is based on rights of the receiver of the services, uh, the, the client or the person to whom the organization or the stakeholders for whom I am doing the services, rendering the services. If, if that service is going good to them, then it means the decision is good. Another thing is that virtue theory, which says the decision is good if it is in accordance to the way a virtuous person would decide. So these are all philosophical theories, but ultimately these are the different ways of perspective. These are different perspectives to see a, a problem and to arrive at a decision. But most of the time you will arrive at the same uh, answer, but sometimes uh, may or may not be. So uh, these are the three uh, uh, steps uh, for the decision making. Uh, one is step one is called golden rule. Uh, it is called all decisions must take into account and reflect a concern for the interest and well-being of all stakeholders. Very simple. Do the right thing. Ethical values and principles always take precedence over the unethical principle. Quite obvious. Third is quite tricky. It says. Uh, very rarely do a wrong uh, make it right. It means it is ethically, no, listen very carefully. It is ethically proper to violate an ethical principle only when it is clearly necessary to advance another true ethical principle, which according to a decision maker's conscience will produce the greatest good in the long run. It means you can violate an ethical uh, principle uh, for a larger, for a, another ethical principle if it is in a, in your opinion, you feel that that will uh, uh, that will produce a uh, greatest good. Uh, so, 
uh, this is another uh, step in decision making. So these are because in day to day life, in, in our professional practice, we have to take uh, uh, these decisions uh, uh, several uh, times. So, for example, uh, uh, if you are a if you are a consultant or, or if you are working in an organization or something, and you are designing a building, and suppose you have designed something and okay, and and it is going for construction, and you notice that 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 whatever you have designed and it is not being implemented or design has been changed by somebody and something else has been given to the site or some wrong is happening uh, and it is not safe. So now, uh, uh, so there is a concept called confidentiality uh, as uh, I think Alok said earlier or conflict of interest, I don't know. So confidentiality is another important thing which a consultant has to ensure. As a, as a principal, as an ethical principal, you have to ensure the confidentiality of the data and the, you have to ensure the privacy of the client. So now you have designed a building, you are supervising something or some, and you have found something wrong is happening and nobody is listening to you. Now, client is not listening to you or your superior is not listening to you and something wrong is happening. So now you have a dilemma that there is an ethical principle that you should not, uh, you should take care of the privacy or, or the confidentiality of the client. And on the other side, you have a larger, uh, another ethical principle that uh, safety and uh, of the stakeholders and all those things. So, but I think this will be a fit case to violate the first one uh, in uh, to 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 go for the public or to go for uh, some uh, some other authorities to ensure that uh, this wrong thing is not uh, can be can be prevented. So uh, there can be uh, some this kind of situations. Okay, so I think I, I don't have much time, so I will uh, like to skip this. Uh, these are the ethical dimensions of the professionalism. See, when a young engineer, a young person, a young qualified person joins an organization, how it he gradually uh, progresses uh, through different phases. These are the level one, level two, and level three. In level one, we say it is a pre-professional. And during pre-professional stage, basically, that young engineer is basically uh, work uh, for 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 himself. He he try to uh, he do not have that broad vision. So he he will he will his concern is to gain uh, of individual. So he will uh, he will be uh, he will have a corporate loyalty the the loyalty for a company for which he is working. But his uh, but client confidence. But for personal advancement, he will do everything for the uh, for the company and uh, for the client but his main priority maybe uh, will be uh, will be probably for personal advancement but in the level 2 stage when he matures uh, somewhat so then what happens at just we say this stage as a level 2 that is professional stage we say uh, the now he starts uh, loyalty to the company and no concern for the society and the environment now he becomes loyal to the company uh, and now he is not concerned with his individual ga uh, gain, but still he do not have any much concern to the society and environment. Now, loyalty to the company is connected to the loyalty to the profession. He is now uh, also concerned with the profession uh, by way of uh, being loyal to the company, but he is not uh, giving emphasis to the societal uh, concerns, basically. Now, level three is the principal professional, which is the senior professional, uh, maybe after 10 years or something. Now, now stage comes when the service uh, to human welfare is important to the, the, the professional. Now society rules and values are more important than the professional standards or the companies or corporate loyalty. So professional conduct is solely now, now in this stage, now stage six, the final stage, the professional conduct is solely guided by the sense of fairness and genuine concern for the society, individuals and environment decisions may contradict with the professional code. Now, this is important. If you are a true professional, you are a senior professional, principal professional, you will definitely take care of the society, environment, safety, you will be fair, you will be genuine. And if required, you may be, you may also violate the professional uh, code if required uh, to do so. Okay, so these are the various levels. Uh, uh, so that is why we say, a, a, a young engineer has to work under a professional, a senior professional for some time to gain that kind of insight. So I think uh, I will try to finish very. Uh, so, uh, uh, so basically engineers shall at all times recognize their, uh, uh, that their primary obligation is to protect the safety, uh, property and welfare of the public. 
if the professional judgment if their professional judgment is overruled under circumstances where the safety health property uh, uh, or welfare of the public are endangered they shall notify their employer client and such other authorities stakeholders as may be appropriate this is uh, important so now just uh, i will uh, say i will take few more few minutes that's all so situation now there can be ethical situations in various ways situation may arise in in our professional practice in conceptualization in design technical specification qualification requirement all those things are basically done by us as a consultant okay so we might be designing or specifying something we may what we may do we may specify something or may design something in such a manner that may benefit some individual or particular organization okay and that may probably that may not be illegal but it, that is that is unethical that is unethical uh, to to prescribe some such thing or uh, some some such thing which may benefit uh, uh, one particular person or particular organization with which i might be uh, affiliated or uh, or i may have some kind of a uh, i do some kind of a connection so uh, uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is unethical practice that allows that in terms of uh, bribery in terms of procurement integrity in terms of uh, 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 so many issues uh, can come in, in various stages of our uh, professional work so uh, ethical dilemma the situation in which moral reasons come into conflict and is not immediately obvious that should be done moral values are many and varied and may make competing claims so basically what happens many times what will happen when you are doing a professional practice you are taking a professional judgment basically the code of ethics will help you to take a particular decision but your individual moral values are different your moral values may conflict with the code of ethics also and ultimately there will be conflict between uh, the your decision which you have to take as a professional according to the code of ethics because you are a member of that professional body or uh, or that profession and your values might be uh, creating a dilemma in you they might be saying no do this do do this but 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 sometime uh, you have to take this in, in some other manner so that kind of dilemma will always be there but i would always say uh go by your values uh, and and keep in mind that the the ultimately uh, the safety the health and the well being of the public or the project is more important than your personal gain or even if required you even if you have to violate the code of ethics although you should not do that but if the larger aim uh, uh, you have to do that probably you can do that uh, in my opinion so uh, these are the various dilemmas right wrong it is very simple you should follow the court yes you should follow the law yes you should not accept bribe yes you should speak and write truthfully yes maintain yes sometime you have to take better words by doing this by taking this decision uh, which will be more better or which will be less worse so that kind of decision uh, you have to take uh, many times so uh, Uh, so so code of ethics may vary little but that code of ethics has already been covered so i can say code of ethics is not a recipe for ethical behavior but yes they guide you uh, to take a correct decision most of the time uh, but it is not a substitute for sound judgment it is not a legal document code of ethics is not a legal document it also does not create new moral or ethical principle because they are basically based on uh, established collective uh, accepted uh, moral uh, values and they serve as a guide ultimately uh, you will take a decision based on your sound judgment so uh, 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 so so ultimately this has already been covered but i will like to talk about fundamental right of an engineer is the right of a professional conscience the right to apply own professional judgment while discharging duty it means if you are in professional engineer it is up to you uh, how you want to exert yourself ultimately your judgment your decision should be final you should not compromise on it okay
last thing is whistle blowing i hope you know uh, if if that some nothing is working and you have no other option probably you may go for whistle blowing it is not that easy but yes that is also an option available to you thank you thank you uh thank you thank you mittal sir for uh, elaborating about uh, ethics different theories of ethics in detail uh, various levels uh, which are being uh, available in the professional organizations uh, ethical dilemmas etc thank you and also thank you very much for uh, highlighting the differences between uh, a client a customer Uh, a consultant and a service provider often often we have an ambiguity between all these uh, yes, yeah. things yes. another thing i want to another another thing i want to tell you is that uh, professional practice we do is not a business what we do is not a business this is a professional practice this is not a business we also sometimes use the term wrongly yes yes i think uh, the fellow engineers who are listening to now get an idea about what do we mean by professional practice <laughs> thank you thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation thank you thank you uh, before we start the question answer session uh, i would like all the all the speakers um, uh, i have a question from my side i want you all to kindly give uh, uh, an advice or a guidance or the path forward to our young structural engineers who are yet to start the profession so what would be your iden uh, advices uh, guidance and the path forward so i'll start with professor tandon so you're on mute i think that basically you must remember we are talking about structural consultancy not the other professions at the moment there may be some commonality with other professions and etc but let's talk about structural engineering uh your interaction with the society is basically indirect there are very few instances where you come in direct contact with society but that indirect contact is so important uh there may not be people who keep telling you now you do this now you do that but if you are not doing what you are supposed to do so what are you supposed to do you are supposed to apply all the skills honestly and in an ethical manner when you when a project is given to you or a assignment is given to you i think assignment is a better word than job or other thing so that is extremely important and i think in life you will come across many instances where your true professionalism or your true ethics would be on test it may be that if you indulge in some corruption or unethical pra practice it uh, it you may uh, uh, sort of uh, there will be so much pressure to come to succumb to it but the true uh, test is that if it's a question of losing a job uh, an assignment or uh succumbing to the you know the pressures that you have they may be of any type i think that is when your true uh, professionalism is tested so there will be many many instances in your career where you will have the choice to either do this or lose the job so it's uh, that is important to know and you must make up your mind right in the beginning as manoj said this is a profession it's not a business if you want to do uh, you know we want to deviate from it there are many other um um 
jobs or whatever which you can adopt in a and you will gain much more but if you are in the field of structural engineering then you have to make sure that you keep on the straight and narrow path irrespective of what it costs the only exception i would like to say and i think uh, mr mithal uh, did mention about something about it the health safety welfare and environment of society these are paramount and must be kept above everything else even when they are in conflict with your own organization's interest or directions but if there is anything to do with these four uh, things health safety welfare and environment these are paramount and they come even before and higher than the the uh, you know the what the organization uh, goals are or interests are and all that so that you must uh, keep in mind and when there is a uh, there is a an opportunity please don't keep silent that's the time to advise other people as to what you should do maybe advise your organization because sometimes the younger people have much more uh, uh, enthusiasm and uh, they they are more uh, concerned with all these issues about ethics than even the people who are higher up in the organization so that's the time when you must speak up and not keep uh, silent so uh, that's all the advice i have for the youngsters and of course please uh, apply your skills uh, and keep uh, uh, gaining more and more skills uh, that that is paramount i mean the, the skills cannot be there is no point where you stop uh, accumulating more skills or better skills i mean you have to keep on doing that till the end of your career but uh, these things are important and i think you should keep that in mind thank you thank you thank you professor tandon before i move on to uh, alok sir for answering uh, uh, we are glad that we have one more uh, expert on the subject mr vinay gupta who is the director and ceo of tandon uh, consultants private limited so i would like to invite uh, dr vinay gupta vikas could you allow dr vinay gupta please yes ma'am yes ma I think till then Alok can give yes. his views. Yes, yes, Alok sir, your views on uh, the advice, okay. guidance, path forward for the youngsters. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, as far as the youngsters is concerned, I would like to just reiterate what I started uh, in my lecture, the opening remarks. when i mentioned that you know as a structural engineers we are sent in the uh, by the by god we are sent here to do good for the humanity and we are doing it on a daily basis so i think uh, as a as an individual it is our job to clean up the society uh, it is our job to think about how do we you know reconcile our moral values our ethical values with the organization that we are working as i said if in the organization you are working the ethical culture is not uh, matching with you know your high ethical culture then i think you have to sort of do something you have to you have to either sort of uh, take a call or take a hard decision but uh, ethics is uh, fundamentally individualistic uh, but it has to finally permeate into the organization ethics matters uh, every individual has his own uh, uh, ethical spectrum it is different so it you cannot calibrate it like mathematics uh, what i i would like to sum up is that each one of us who believes to follow a high ethical standard by some default should bring our own ethical standard to the organization we are working 
we might be surrounded by people who don't think alike uh, but on many occasions you may face a situation where you have to take hard decisions i think you should take it and in many occasions you can also change the situation so it is all you know in uh, individually and collectively we have to work collectively it is much harder but individually it is not that difficult thank you thank you thank you alok sir so uh, mithil sir your your views on this okay so i don't think i am old enough to give some advice to <laughs> to any student <laughs> but, but but in any case uh, i believe that uh, uh uh if you talk about the senior students and the young engineers i would say first of all you make your mind in which direction you want to go as tender sir was saying uh if you really want to see uh, if you really want to come to the profession as a consultant be prepared uh, to follow high standards of ethics okay so don't run after the money money will come to you if you will be uh, ethical in your practice uh, uh, then then definitely uh, you will get the work and you will get the money you may not get the large chunk of money but you will get the money don't worry you will get the uh, reputation you will have name people will know you you will be having more satisfaction don't worry about the money even if you have to do the job because of the ethical practice following the ethics let the job go i have lost many jobs in my profession large significant jobs and and i still feel i am very happy okay i feel very happy so this is only advice just follow simple live simple think high do hard work be sincere follow ethical practices that's all forget ye kya kar raha hai wo kya kar raha hai government kya kar rahi hai wo kya kar rahi hai forget everything you do your work that's all you have given a very simple mantra which is uh, <laughs> i think very very difficult to follow but we see, have if you to can see if, sir, if you cannot sleep at 9 o'clock in yes. the night and you cannot get up at 6 o'clock i think something is wrong in somewhere in your system <laughs> right thank you thank you uh, mithil sir so i would like to invite uh, vinay gupta dr vinay gupta i think he is he is on mute mute he is on yeah. mute vikas unko phone karo yes yeah, sir unko join to kiya hai but he is in another meeting okay huh? don't worry vishal ji oh. you continue vishal <laughs> ji you yeah. continue continue yes yes so uh, let's take up some of the questions i would concentrate on the questions related to the subject there are many questions related to the structural engineering that we would take if time permits but let's first concentrate on the Uh, questions which are uh, related to the subject the first question is from uh, mr bhushan he is asking first the consultancy firms are troubled is the budget lowest of the project budget allocated for technical services and supports Communica communication versus restricted scope which is bigger challenge i think he is trying to ask related to the lowest budget which is been allocated uh, for the technical supports and the services so are we troubled as in consultancy form related to the budget uh, may i yes, <laughs> are we talking about the financial budget or are we talking about the budget in the project <laughs> project budget i think so okay. no, no you see i think i think he, i think he is talking about our professional fees and meager professional fee and all is it like that no he he might be talking about the project budget okay huh. because the lowest project uh, the project is been allocated to the uh, lowest, lowest bidder okay meeting, okay isn't it? so in consulting yes, consulting okay. yes in consulting firms yeah so, i mean this is uh, this is a big problem and i think uh, in uh, uh, particularly in infrastructure projects we have been talking about it for quite some time we have been trying to convince and uh, the clients to follow a qcbs system that means quality cost based uh, uh, you know assessment that means uh, the technical uh, competence should be given a higher percentage 
it can be 70 30 or 80 20 so uh, first you have to evaluate technically the consultant and give marking and give weightage of 80 percent or say 70 percent and then the financial offer 30 percent and then you finally decide it's a techno uh, uh, commercial uh, sort of evaluation so that is being practiced uh, in many with many clients but many clients do not follow also so for consultants a you know uh, internationally it is a practice to follow a qcbs system follow but i think in most of the uh, time in india also this system is being followed for for the consultants for the, it is not for the, even for the, the government system, for the government yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but many consultants working for private sector, they go by L1. I mean, architects will not uh, follow QCBS. <laughs> See, first of all, I, 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 yes, I want to intervene here also. See, many people, uh, particularly in structural engineering uh, uh, consultant, they work as a sub-consultant to the architects and they feel that architect is their client. No, client is the client. Client is ultimately the user, the owner is the client. Go here. You are only working as a sub consultant to the to 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 as, as sub. You are only working as a sub consultant. That's all. So even if you are working for an architect, you are getting the fee from an architect. Still, you must ensure that uh, see architect will not have uh, that uh, bidding kind of a system. So basically, they they have a set of consultant with whom they have a tie up and with whom they have a good chemistry. So they keep on working with them. So still, if you are a good consultant. You should exert yourself. You should dictate your terms, and probably you will get a good fee even from from them also. See, in my experience, I have lost many projects, but fee was hardly any issue uh, in my career. Hardly an issue. Uh, most of the time, I got the fee which I asked for, for even for from architect. But Mr. <laughs> Mittal is the lucky structural engineer. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally, I know, I don't know why people are not getting the fee. I literally get the fee. I get the last installment also, most of the time. Uh, so I don't have that kind of a problem because I, uh, further, whenever I'm working, see, I may be, uh, I don't think I'm the only person like that. Even if I am working for the architects on a project, most of the time I do interact with the client on the project. Yes, I think. The first thing I think that you must try to do is that the payment is not through the architect. It has to come directly from the client. So one part that as if they own you is uh, gone, then you can, you know, do the work that you are supposed to do and not and so get further, 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 even if you are getting the fee from the architect and you get the chance and you are interacting with the client architect will be forced to give you the fee because when you will be interacting with the client client understands you clients understands your uh, value yes. and architect will be under pressure to pay you okay thank you uh, there's one more question from the same gentleman mr bhushan uh, he's saying that without uh, knowing the skills they are using the software tools many people without having requisite knowledge. I think it's one source of ethical conduct. And what's your take on this? Yes, true. Basically, what is happening? Somebody is using the software without having basic fundamentals of uh, engineering. So it means he do not have requisite uh, competence to, to do the work. So if still he is doing the work, it means he is doing an ethical practice. It is very simple. Okay. Engineer is supposed to be an engineer. He is not a mechanic. He is not an operator. He is supposed to have a brain. He has to apply the fundamental. He should know how to go from the basics. Okay. Thank you. So this question is for Mr. Alok uh, Mr. Kanchan Roy Chaudhary is asking, Mr. Bhavmik, can you please brief on the aspects of sustainability? How the structural engineering and the IS Traki are addressing the issue in achieving the SDGs, uh, which are to be attained by 2030, and how to achieve net zero by 2070? <laughs> I think uh, very, very good question, very but not broad. really. 
question <laughs> not really pertinent to this particular no, lecture see but anyway i think it's a good good question and let me i don't know whether this gentleman has attended yesterday's uh, lecture by institution of structural engineers and ias structure combined which was organized uh, on uh, climate emergency mm. the engineer engineering in climate emergency and that was an excellent lecture by professor mike cook and uh, mr will arnold and uh, 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 this was this was organized in there i in my closing remarks i mentioned that you know the climate emergency or cl this climate change is unfortunately not a subject from our civil engineering syllabus uh, therefore the measures to be taken to secure our future it demands a complete paradigm shift in our approach to structural design presently our structural design we are focusing on you know of uh, durability uh, uh, economy etc we have uh, we have hardly any provision for sustainability in our uh, daily course so it is a completely new context for us and uh, it is an emergency i mean it is not something which we can uh, slowly improve upon it has to be done very fast so what i was mentioning as an association uh, ia structi we have in fact a huge task ahead i mean the structural engineers uh, uh, we have to prepare because as a as an objective of our association we are supposed to train uh, our engineers uh, our members in the direction in which we want to go and for this to happen we need to completely redefine our our principles our training modules have to change a lot of work is to be done and yesterday during that lecture series i in fact uh, was uh, requesting professor mike cook and will arnold or institution of structural engineers uk who, with whom we have a mou that let us partner together and work because i can tell you lot of work has been done in various countries including uk us europe on uh, sustainability so far in india it has just started we are at least two years behind in terms of work and i my fear is that this gap of two years is going to widen with time because the pace with which they are going we are not going to go with that pace so i think this is an emergency situation and Uh, not only our association i think all of us all stakeholders have to work in tandem everybody has to be in the same room as far as climate emergency is concerned and it's a huge it's a huge challenge and uh, i am aware of it and i think uh, in our own uh, governing council we need to have a serious discussion on this and we are also trying to organize uh, uh, webinars on this issue and further i want to tell that our structural engineers must also go through the national building code i think part 19 or part 11 19 i think 11 that is about sustainability approach to design at least we should go through that we should learn that there is another standard on of cd 29 on sustainability management so i think we should also uh, go through that and uh, i always say that uh, when we design any structural design traditionally we do for functionality for uh, economy and for safety but sustainability should also be a, another fourth pillar in our design so we must and i think it is not very difficult but i think we should try to focus that and uh, we need to learn also also yes definitely we we will we will try to do more on that yes 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 sustainability think, always needs a holistic approach yes i think these uh, there is a start i mean which uh, mr mitter has already mentioned about the uh, national building code i mean there there is a start that is at least the starting point yes uh, which has been made and i think that this requires since it is not going to be taught in any engineering institution for a long long time that is what it looks like they are going to they have introduced humanities and things like that but i have not seen anywhere where they are concentrating on sustainability i think the the whole uh, the only place where i can see is life cycle cost 
at least that concept has emerged over the years. Over the years means the last two, three years. And uh, that is again the starting point only. The, the life cycle cost, not go by the immediate cost. And that is how even the projects should be evaluated. Yes. As it is not very difficult, uh, it is also not very difficult to understand the concept of embodied energy, carbon footprint, and all those things. Those things can be calculated. And, uh, and if you see the structure, uh, see the how much uh, uh, energy intensive material we are using actually, uh, concrete and all those things. So we need to understand all those things and uh, we I think uh, we need to organize many more events uh, to to, yes. to, keep, to create awareness about it. In this uh, environment and sustainability, sir, uh, it, it's a compulsory uh, mandatory subject to be taken by all uh, students in any university in whichever stream you are studying. The Supreme Court has made it mandatory course. Either it can uh, be credited or non-credited, but each and every student should go through this course, which deals with environment as well as sustainability. Uh, may I add something? From, uh, Dr. Yes. Salachi? Yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to, you see, in yesterday's lecture, uh, you know, what in UK, what they have done is the Institution of Structural Engineers UK, they have come out with a book as to uh, how to calculate the embodied carbon factor. Uh, that means, you see, just like you, uh, people who are health conscious, they, they calculate the calories they have consumed every day. They have some cal calculations. Similarly, for every project, you are supposed to calculate the embodied, uh, embodied energy that you are consuming. And there are many uh, consulting organizations across the globe who are committing to reduce this carbon footprint in their project, which are ongoing by 40%, 30%, 50% like that. So in order to reduce the carbon footprint in a project, you need to know how to calculate the carbon footprint, how to calculate this ECF factor or embodied carbon factor. And this requires some initial guidelines, which needs to be prepared, I think. And not only to be prepared, it has to be also duly approved by the government. It should be something like the least schedule of rates, something available, which the consultants eventually can use to show that by this option in the project, they have reduced the carbon footprint by so many percentage. The other option, maybe initial cost is high, but the carbon footprint is low. Maybe it is a better option. So now, see, this is non-existent as of now, but this is the way forward. I think next question is very interesting. I think you take next yeah, question. That's a very absolutely. interesting question. Yeah. The next question is from Mr. Ashutosh. He's asking that if a structural engineers understand that some of the clauses in our Indian standard codes, uh, which are very conservative, we all know that. Okay. Uh, if, uh, uh, if a consultant uses international codes uh, and do the designs, and don't follow the current uh, codal provisions of that country. So is it an ethical practice? Very, very interesting question. <laughs> I uh, may, I, may I have, have my, my view? Yes, yes, your first view, sir. <laughs> okay, firstly, I think there is, there, let there be no ambiguity on this issue because this I have faced in my uh, you know, career several times. Generally, if you are having a project uh, the codes that you have to follow are a part of the contract agreement. In which case, whether you agree or disagree, whether it is conservative, you are duty bound contractually to follow that code. So there is no option there. But uh, in many codes, for example, uh, they allow you to follow international codes. Right? There are clauses which says that, okay, if you follow international codes, then also it is acceptable. I mean, as a new technology, in, uh, in even in you know infrastructure projects in uh, ministry, uh, they have started adding a clause that if you are going to follow, if you want to uh, imbibe new technology and by following international code, that is allowed. Uh, and if you can bring economy, of course, you have to show that this this proposal is economical and it is following a particular code. It is allowed in some cases. So it depends on the project you are working whether. 
deviation from the indian standards or indian roads congress is allowed by contract if it is allowed fine you go ahead but if it is not allowed the, it is not a ethical issue it is a contractual issue also i think that we should not deviate from the code the indian codes at all and that uh, the uh, the design uh, uh, basis should really be the indian codes if it is not given at all if it is given fine and if they are allowing you to go to american code or something is fine but the place where if you feel strongly that there is something which is uneconomical uh, or something like that then you must raise it in the right forum the the place to raise it no, is not that you don't follow the 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 code but you raise it in the right forum you make enough noise and you will be heard so it's that, that that's what you should remember don't start arguing when <laughs> when you are doing an assignment and you think that this should go this way or that way when your terms of reference calls for following the indian codes and indian codes i think which they may be conservative but they take account of not only the design they also take account of the construction practices that are in, existent in india and i think that indian codes should be different from the uh, you know instead of borrowing something from europe or america or something like that because the standards of construction are also different if you make a design which is following the american code not that it is wrong but that project should be built in america not in india if you build make, build it in india then you must follow the uh, environment which exists here and that is what is reflected in our codes and if it doesn't then the codes should be modified to reflect that not just copying uh you know from somewhere and putting it in the code yeah actually uh, perfect sir <laughs> the other question is uh, to uh, sir tandon dr visalakshi dr visalakshi actually i have to leave uh, uh, i have to join another babita so okay. if you permit me yeah yeah sure I'm sure thank you thank you so much for your time and uh, for discussing the very sensitive issues thank you thank, thank you, you so much. thank you thank you so much thank you so this question is uh, to professor tandon uh, professor suneja is asking would you like to comment on the <clears throat> basic reason of collapse of hanging bridge over chambal river in kota long back whether it was due to some ethical issues lack of profession or what was the main issue no i i i think there is none of these it's really um i would say that it is coordination between the construction and the design which caused this uh, problem the um you must know the temporary stages of construction and those are extremely important most of the failures are happening <coughs> during construction stages and that's where we are not paying in enough attention we were discussing only in the morning uh, for one of the projects that even when you have let us say 10 pre stressing cables to be tensioned you must check up at every cable when you stress whether it is safe or not or is it going to create a problem and many places which we have seen recently also it showed cracks and the moment we told the client of course it was not our project but he had nevertheless uh, come to uh, uh, ask advice that you try to first see instead of saying that the design is wrong whether a simple thing like the sequence of pre stressing should be changed same pre stressing same concrete same everything but the sequence of pre stressing should be changed now this is a why i'm saying uh, is that every time you do some change in the structure it may be a pre stressing cable it may be adding another segment it may be whatever things keep happening to the structure 
at every stage you must make sure that the structure is safe and particularly so during construction stages <clears throat> thank you so that is what i think the problem was there thank you uh, this is a question from our own uh, mr sunil dhawan he is asking uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is related to the <laughs> structural engineering we we have completed the questions related to this topic so i i just taken up one uh, question uh, related to structural engineering he is asking to explain about the fire safety in tall buildings the plumbing uh, system i think that will be difficult to take yeah. here, i think that will be very difficult <clears throat> Anyway, Mr. Dhawan, all these things have to be taken into account. I mean, <laughs> they're not only structural engineers in a project, in a major project, you have various disciplines and there is somebody looking after the fire also, fire aspects. And of course, he has to look at that, uh, uh, that portion and collectively, if the person is not looking after it, you have to advise him to look after it. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Kishan is asking, what is the reason that there is no standard of charges for structural consultancy? <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem is that even when you make these, and there are several trials people have made, several institutions which have made this attempt to standardize charges, the first culprit who does not follow that are our own profession, members of our own profession. So I think the members of our own profession have to first realize that when they are quoting or negotiating a project, it is not the last project on earth that you have to keep on uh, you know, reducing the fee, but it happens, it seems like that, that they think that now the, the whole profession is going to come to a halt, but there are no more projects. And they keep on uh, every time uh, reducing the fee, which is uh, which means that our profession itself is responsible for not having a standard uh, charges which are being followed. Even Indian in, uh, in, uh, Institute of our uh, Indian Association of Structural Engineers has some charges and all that. They are put on the website. But uh, uh, who is actually following it? I mean, if we ourselves don't uh, follow that, then we can't blame anybody else. No man from Mars is going to come and tell you that you, what you're doing is wrong. You have to <laughs> follow the, the, the ethics of the profession, the standards uh, that are being set by these institutions who have spent so many so much time to come to what should the standard charges be, but that has to be followed. And that is where our own profession is uh, failing. Yes. This question uh, by Mr. Ashutosh in continuous to the previous question related to the following whether Indian standard codes or uh, are the foreign codes, <clears throat> he's saying that the wind speed in Indore, which is his hometown, is given as 170 kmph, whereas they have never experienced a wind speed more than 80. So in that case, which code to be followed as an ethical practice? See, it's a very simple. Okay. See, you saying that you have not experienced a wind speed of more than 80 and in the code it is given 170. See, you ultimately, when you are designing a building, you have to follow certain codes. And you have to sign a certain stability certificate also. And you have to follow the building bylaws of your indoor or local body. They say follow the BI standards. So BI standards become the mandatory. Ultimately, you have to follow the BI standards. Now, in the BI standards, it is it, 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 if it is mentioned that mid speed is 170 or something. Now, if they have mentioned is 170, that must be based on certain data. Okay. And you cannot just question is based on your experience. If you want to question is, you can definitely write to the BIS and they will examine it and they will modify it. But as such, if you are taking 80, 
then probably you are risking yourself as a building as the owners users everybody everybody actually and then then why you want to do that and further if you if question is ethical or unethical i think it will be unethical only it, it will not be ethical because you are supposed to follow a code you do not have that kind of a knowledge you are not a scientist you do not have testing laboratory or you do not have the data available with you you are just saying you have not experienced that kind of in the speed so i don't think that is a uh, and it doesn't mean that it will not happen in future also so i would say follow the code uh, not following the code will probably be, will be the unethical kind of practice <laughs> <laughs> but but in the previous question which you were saying that you found that some provision is on the conservative side and you fall you saw some uh, other uh, uh, international code where where uh, where you can save some money or something or yes it may happen it may happen like that but the situation of the courts may be different indian context may be different as tender tender saw was saying an american uh, setting may be different so still i would say Uh, your judgment about the clause regarding the uh, that may not be correct actually and further further if you are very much convinced if you are a scientist scientist or you have some kind of research and you can establish and you can prove that the provision given the code is not correct or on the conservative side or what you want to say backed by some scientific thing uh, it will save the money to your client significant money to the client then probably you can take up with the bis or you can take up with the client and if your client agrees and 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 if you can convince uh, uh, then then probably you can do that i, I would, i'm not saying that but i would say it is very risky and uh, because bi standard provisions are bare minimum standard which you need to follow actually uh, i will tell you very very interesting yesterday i recorded a podcast with sanjay pant only and i read several such question to the sanjay pant and it has very interesting answers so i am not doing it publicity of my podcast but i am saying it is very relevant you you listen to that because it will be released on 15th it, and now we are doing editing for that i have asked so many questions similar questions to the sanjay pant okay i even asked a question i will tell you i even asked him pis i made a, a standard are they dependable he said yes i said okay uh, if i design a building according to your bi standard and some mishap occurs in the building and if, if i can prove that this mishap has occurred because of the in uh, inadequate provision given in the bis code who will be responsible bis or codal committee or the chairman of the committee or committee members who will responsible for that even i asked this question to also i had to us in that thing okay so 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 the, the questions which uh, mr ashtosh is asking similar question are there i think okay. just uh, i want to add one more uh, aspect to it you see as far as earthquake and wind is concerned uh during your lifetime that may not you may not experience that but what are we talking about we are talking about a return period of 500 years and things like that now return period of 500 years means what it doesn't mean that it will happen if it is happened today it will happen after 500 years that's not the idea but it is based on statistics as to uh, how much uh, i mean this is just a uh, statistics which tells you that this is the periodicity of the uh, Uh, of of these uh, earthquake and wind of that magnitude may take place it may happen tomorrow 500 years return period doesn't mean it happens after 500 years it can happen tomorrow also in a 500 year return period so when you see something and you say that i have not experienced in my lifetime that may be so but that still does not justify you know making a change unless like mr mithal said if you are a scientist and you've got all these data and uh, then of course you should justify it and send it to the bis committee we have got separate people looking after this only i mean we got a separate code where the the, the wind uh, map of india is being discussed and rediscussed etc similarly the map earthquake map of india those things are based on whatever the knowledge we have they have gone up to 
you know the olden times uh, thousand years ago or whatever whenever they had even an inkling that an earthquake happened uh, they are taking that into account and even i can tell you uh, that uh, when the latur earthquake came in uh, i think uh, uh, when 90 90s or 2000 something i do not know latur earthquake came so when we we designed several buildings in latur prior to that and we provided all the provisions given in the bis code at that time uh, on those days there was very old standards were there but we used we followed all those things and even the client was saying why you are providing that and why you providing all the bands and why providing reinforcement of the corners and all those things but we did everything even those architects and all those were why you are doing that nobody is doing that we said no 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 we will do that because it is given the code and i i i, I have faith in the bis code when we did that after the earthquake came in the latur only and latur was then then same client same people they said oh our building is perfectly all right nothing has happened we are very we are, you did a very thing we were saying no but you still insisted and we did that so ultimately the provisions of bi code has proven with the time actually so i think we should have faith on our codes and we should follow that unless until we have a strong reason to prove that yes and also we need to understand that these codal provisions are been uh, given and written by a committee expert committee after various rigorous deliberations so we have to understand that with all the data and the uh, experiments to prove that okay uh, so i think uh, we have exhausted with the questions and we are uh, also running out of time so it's time to wind up the session so uh, uh, as a honorary secretary i would like to give the vote of thanks i would like to thank professor mahesh tandan for his time uh, to deliver a talk on this very sensitive issues uh, thank you so much professor tandan and uh, it was it was it was and is always a pleasure to listen to you whatever you say it's always a pleasure to listen to you oh, thank you and thank always you. inspiring inspiring uh, talk well, thank you so much and uh, mr mittal thank you thank you for um, uh, heading these uh, type of webinars and uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, for being instrumental in order to organize such a sensitive issue in a public forum thank you thank you thank thanks you. are also due to uh, uh, mr alok bhamik who had already left the session he he is the uh, main instrumental person for all these webinars organizing all these webinars so thanks are also due to mr alok bhamik and um, last but not the least thanks are due to mr vikas and anamika who are our uh, off screen uh, uh, soldiers working uh, behind the screen to have a hassle free webinars and uh, all these uh, sessions thank you vikas and anamika so much and uh, uh, mr vinay gupta has not joined due to some technical issues he has sent a regret note okay so uh, it's okay uh, uh, dr vinay gupta we'll try to catch up with you some other time <laughs> thank you so and before you shut us off i think that uh, at least i would like to say thank you so much uh, professor visa lakshi for very ably conducting this uh, session and uh, i think all of us have gained from it and it is thanks to you uh, that uh, things have gone very smoothly and of course you have thanked everybody else but i must thank you above all yes yes sure yes definitely no sir the speakers are very disciplined they were on time so uh, there was no need for me to be a hard task master so <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. in that way i need to thank all the speakers to be very disciplined and on time thank you and last but not the least thank to all the participants i uh, hope you have gained uh, some knowledge and uh, you have you have some takeaways from these webinars maybe we have given you some food of thought in order to practice uh, ethics and morals in your professional life do write to us 
do give us the feedback related to the sessions. And if you are not a uh, uh, member of the organization, I would request you all to become a member and uh, uh, participate in the knowledge dissemination for the structural profession. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.